Hello, welcome to Armor of God Apologetics. Uh, this is Wayne Harsha, I'm your host. And this is actually an interesting video because I was actually trying to do this tonight as a co-streamed uh, Facebook Live and Zoom class for the church that I go to, which is Victory Outreach Church of Tacoma. Unfortunately, I had some significant technical difficulties and was not able to do that uh, live. So. I'm going to offer this class uh, online uh, as a video, so let's uh, let's get right into it. Uh, this is an eight-week class that I'm going to be giving for uh, my church, Victory Outreach Church of Tacoma, and so we'll get right into it. It's about apologetics and specifically about God and the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, again, uh, the, the study tonight is of Christian apologetics, and this will be step one in an eight-step series. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, just to kind of tell you about how my world is colored and where I came from. I grew up in the Bible Belt in a little town called Whitmire, South Carolina that you see pictured there in the upper left-hand corner. It's a town of about a little under 2,000 people when I grew up there and uh, had about 23 churches. So there was actually a lot of churches uh, where I grew up. And then I went to Furman University, and Furman uh, is a, was a Baptist school in Greenville, South Carolina. It no longer is a Southern Baptist school, um, but I got a degree in chemistry there. Um, and that just kind of tells you, I, my background really is in science originally. My dad was a science teacher, um, and before that he worked in the nuclear industry, and I was a chemist. And so following Furman, I went on and got an MD degree, and I'm actually a practicing physician, so that also colors the way I see things to some degree. But then I had the opportunity uh, in 2017, 2018, to get a master's degree at Liberty University in Christian apologetics. I run now uh, this ministry, Armor of God Apologetics, which of course is found here on Facebook, or on YouTube rather, but also is found on Facebook. Um, and so uh, be sure to check us out on, on both of those platforms. So let's start our class by talking about worldviews. And first of all, I will say everybody has a worldview, whether they know it or not. But the question really is, what the heck is a worldview? Well. Uh, here's a worldview uh, definition. And this definition, of course, is extremely complex. Uh, it's the set of beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all one's perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. And it involves epistemology, metaphysics, cosmology, teleology, theology, anthropology, and axiology. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of ologies. And the reality is that's way, way too complex of a definition. Um, and so I like this one by Pastor Brett Nicholson, and I, this is actually from a, a YouTube video that I watched. Um, and uh, this, this definition is much plainer and, and, and easier to understand. Your worldview is what you believe about the most important and meaningful questions of life. Um, and not only is it what you believe about it, but it also colors then how you see everything else in the rest of the world. And so it's very important. And again, uh, everybody has a worldview. There are three main worldviews out there in the world today. And of course, the one we come from as Christians is the theistic worldview. The theistic worldview holds that not only is there a creator God, but that that God sustains the world and actually intervenes in the world from time to time. Um, and the three main theistic world religions are Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Now, of course, there is something called deism, which is fairly closely related, but deism actually is kind of the idea that there is an all-powerful being that kind of started the world, created the world, kind of wound it up and just let it go like, uh, like the Energizer Bunny or a ticking uh, clock or watch, but doesn't really intervene in the world. And then the second type of worldview is naturalism. And naturalism is the concept or the worldview that uh, the physical world is all that there is. Uh, and that's 
that it truly encompasses everything. So in, in other words, the matter that exists in the universe is all that exists. There is nothing immaterial out there. And so materialism is another uh, name for naturalism. And basically what that means is that they have, uh, from the get-go, ruled out anything supernatural. Uh, they've also ruled out, by the way, things like the mind or a soul. And so if you're someone who believes in a soul or a mind separate from the brain, then you, by definition, don't believe in naturalism or materialism. And then the third main uh, worldview out there is pantheism. Now, pantheism is the, the idea that basically God is everything. He's all present. Um, he's the totality of reality. And so uh, world religions, like kind of New Age world religions, and some Eastern religions like Hinduism believe in a pantheistic worldview. And that's why some of them have tens of thousands of deities. There's a sun god and a moon god and a tree god. And so that's pantheism. So moving on, uh, beliefs about something. And we talked about how beliefs make up your worldview. Beliefs all start with a claim. Okay, now in the case of uh, religious uh, beliefs, of course, they start with a claim about the religion itself. God exists. Or um, Muhammad was the prophet. Uh, or... Um, that uh, in the case of Judaism, uh, the you know God is a is a monotheistic God, and there is no the Savior has not come yet. So there are all beliefs. But let's let's take let's take religion out of it for just a moment, just to understand where this is going. So uh, so let's start with the concept of Area Fifty One, right? People have different beliefs in terms of Area 51. And some people thoroughly believe that the government is hiding extraterrestrial beings at Area 51 and keeping them from the people. So that's the belief. There are beings, there are extraterrestrial beings at Area 51. ET lives there. Okay, And then those people then have reasons for that belief. So if you believe that there are aliens at Area 51, then there are reasons that you believe it. Perhaps your parents taught you that. And so you'll hear, uh, you know, hey, uh, my, my parents believed that these things existed or that UFOs existed. Perhaps you believe you were abducted by aliens at some point. Uh, perhaps you've read a bunch of sci-fi and you believe it. For whatever reason, there are, there are reasons behind you holding your belief that you have. And then there are implications to that belief. Um, and so that's the, well, if this is true, if there are aliens at Area 51, what are the consequences? What comes from that? What is implied by that type of a belief system. And if you're talking, let's take us uh, to the Area 51 scenario. If you believe that there, are, uh, that there are aliens there and that if there actually are aliens there, then that implies two main things. Number one, extraterrestrial life exists. And number two, the government has been keeping that from us for many, many years. Um, so that uh, that's important. Now let's come back to Christianity for a moment. So if Christianity is true and the reasons behind it are correct and uh, and it is it is true and it is real, then there are implications to that. The opposite is true. So, for instance, if there is no God, if God does not exist, then there is no real objective uh, moral rights and wrongs. It's all just a matter of opinion. So, moving on, I want to tell you, there is this concept among a lot of new atheists that uh, they are neutral to the subject. They'll simply say, well, I lack a belief in God. Well, first of all, if you lack a belief in God, that's not really atheism. Atheism, in my mind at least, and in the mind of most theists, um, is actually the belief that there is no God. It's a positive belief that there is no God. Those people are not neutral. Okay, Christians are not neutral. Muslims are not neutral. Neutrality is a myth. It's an absolute myth. All of us have a worldview, and that colors how we see the world. Nothing 
in terms of our beliefs are neutral. In fact, even history is not neutral. History is written by people. Those people have worldviews, and because of that, history is not neutral either. So when, when uh, atheists make the claim that, oh, well, we can't trust uh, the documents in the Bible because they were written by people who had an agenda, yeah, absolutely they were. So was every other piece of history out there, because neutrality is a myth. And here's the disclaimer. I'm a Christian. I'm guilty. Okay, there's no doubt about it. I come from a Christian worldview. That's okay with me. Um, but you do have to understand that that's going to color everything that I think of. Now, moving on, what is Christian apologetics? Well, it comes from the word, the Greek word, apologia. And what does that word mean? Well, apologia is a speech in defense of oneself or of something. In this case, Christian apologetics, so an apologia for Christianity, is a defense of the Christian faith. Many people make the mistake and think that apologetics is apologizing for our belief. That's absolutely not true. Nobody's apologizing for our Christian belief. It's simply a defense. So, for instance, in the Bible, when Paul is on trial uh, in the court of Festus, he gives an apologia for, his, for what he's on trial for. He's giving a defense, like a legal defense. So, the life verse of all Christian apologists is 1 Peter 3.15. And it reads like this. This is the English Standard Version. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer, apologia, or defense, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So there's three parts of this verse, and many people leave out parts of it based on what they're trying to do. But I want to I implore you to understand that this verse is important in all three parts. And the first part is to set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. In other words, don't come at apologetics with, a, with a, a mindset of neutrality. No. Use your Christian faith and set apart Christ as Lord in your heart as you're giving your defense. So that's the first part. Don't come from it in a neutral sense. Come from it from your Christian worldview. The second thing is always be prepared to give a defense for your faith or your beliefs. We saw that in the Bible in many, many areas. In Acts, for instance, they described the Apostle Paul in many instances as walking into the synagogue and for days reasoning with them from the scriptures. He's giving a defense. Even Jesus, when asked by John's disciples, are you really the one? Are you really the Christ? What did he say? Go tell John what you see. The blind have sight. The, the deaf uh, get their hearing. The, the dead are raised, uh, are raised to life. He didn't say, just believe. He said, here's the evidence. So give a defense. And then the third part is, make sure you do that with gentleness and respect. Now the next question is, well, what exactly is Christianity? Well, Christianity... Um, this is the way I like to think of it. Again, going back to our alien theme that we've been talking about. If an alien spaceship came down to, the, to, to Earth and said uh, and gathered information about the different religions of the world, and they went back to their home planet and their leader said to them, what did you find out? And they said, well, we found these different religions and one of them is Christianity. And they, the leader said, well, what is Christianity? Well, what are the core? Four things that that alien would have to take away from this planet to understand what is Christianity. And to me, those boil down to two prime essential elements. The first is God exists. Not only does God exist, that God is a creator and sustainer of the world and the universe, and that God exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a triune God, one God, three persons. Of course, uh, the, the first verse of Genesis, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
and then Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is the Shema, which all uh, devout Jews say every day, which goes in, in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Aloheinu, Yahweh Echad, which in English is, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And of course, then the New Testament expounds upon, and I would argue that it's in the Old Testament as well, the fact that, it, that God exists, uh, co-eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then the other part of Christianity, of course, is the life, death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus has existed in eternity, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus came to earth fully God and fully man to save the world from our sins. So in the first half, we will talk about the existence of God and the evidence for the existence of God. In the second half, we'll talk about the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first question, of course, is, does God exist? Now, of course, I believe that, and many Christians would actually ask, why even ask the question, does God exist? After all, God does not need defending. That's true. I completely agree. God doesn't need defending. He can defend himself. However, people need help understanding God. Okay? And many people need help getting to God. And so that's why I ask the question, does God exist? Plus, there are people who deal with doubt. Very few Christians have ever not dealt with doubt about Jesus or about God at some point in their walk with God. So examining the evidence and examining the, the arguments for the existence of God can help people in dealing with their own doubts. And in fact, many people would argue that apologetics builds on faith. So faith begets someone looking into the evidence more and that evidence helps them build their faith, which helps them look into it more, which helps build their faith. So it's an important part of building someone's faith and helping them in dealing with doubt. Now, I want to address something really quickly, and that is that there is this concept out there in the, in, by many people today that all religions simply teach another way to God. They're all just different paths to the same God. And I'm sorry, but that simply is not true. So in order to explain this, I have to explain one concept of philosophy. And it's the only concept I'll talk about in this eight-week series uh, that has to do with philosophy. And that is the prime starter of philosophy, which is the law of non-contradiction. Basically what that is, is it's, it's saying that something can't have one quality and not have that quality at the same time. Here's an example. A car cannot both be red and not red in the same time, in the same manner. Okay? A car can't have a red paint job and not a red paint job in the same time, at, in the same manner. It just can't happen. So how does that apply here? Well, in fact, religions of the world contradict each other. Therefore, they cannot all be true. Of course, in Christianity, we believe Christianity is the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's, of course, what Christians believe. Well, let's examine just one other world religion, Islam. Islam's holy book is the Quran. And in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 157, it says, Neither did they crucify him, nor was he killed, in speaking of Jesus. On one hand, you have Christianity that says that Jesus was killed on a Roman cross and died and resurrected on the third day. On the other hand, you have Islam that says Jesus wasn't even killed. Now, Christianity could be true and Islam false. Islam could be true and Christianity could be false, but they cannot both be true by simple one fact. And that's it. So those contradict, and that's just an example of that. Okay. Now, moving on, our first three weeks, these upcoming three weeks, will be spent talking about the arguments for God's existence. These are also oftentimes called theistic arguments. 
Anytime you see the word the or theo or theist, it's talking about God. Okay, so theistic arguments or arguments for God's existence. The first one we will cover next week actually is a series of arguments called the cosmological arguments. And that is basically the study of cosmology is the study of the universe and the origins of the universe. So it's the arguments for the existence of God that come out of the origin of the universe. The most well-known of these is called the Kalam, K-A-L-A-M, -K Kalam cosmological argument. This is how it goes. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. The second uh, set of arguments that we will talk about are called the teleological arguments. Teleological, uh, te the word teleological comes from the Greek word telos. And the Greek word telos means either purpose or goal. So these are arguments from design. In other words, uh, they are arguments that the universe is too finely tuned. And the earth is too finely tuned for the existence of life. And God, the pinnacle of creation, is too finely tuned for it to be from chance. In fact, this even goes down to the one cell organism level, like the bacterial flagellum, or even the biochemical pathways within the human cell that generates our energy and all of our processes within each of our individual cells in the body. In fact, it even involves DNA. DNA is one of the greatest pieces of evidence for God's existence out there. I actually did a video on it a couple weeks back, and it's posted, and you can find that uh, on my channel. So DNA is uh, incredible uh, evidence for God's existence, both because of the complexity, how it comes together, as well as the fact that it is one of the greatest, most complex languages ever to even be discovered let alone invented. It's too complex for even humans to have invented. The third thing that we will talk about, or the third argument that we will talk about, is also a series of arguments called the moral arguments for God's existence. Now, this was first popularized by the great author C.S. Lewis. Some people don't know, C.S. Lewis was actually an ardent atheist for a long time. And because of that, because of the moral argument, and because of morality, that's how C.S. Lewis actually came to understand and know and believe in Christ and in God. And that is spelled out in his book, Mere Christianity. The moral arguments include both uh, the fact that without God, there is no objective moral rights and wrongs. And also, there is no, um, there is no obligation. So without God, why be good? Okay. Ravi Zacharias, who is one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, apologists, uh, Christian apologists, uh, this is a quote from him, and he says, Having killed God, the atheist is left with no reason for being, no morality to espouse, no meaning to life, and no hope beyond the grave. And one of the moral arguments simply goes something like this, Without a God who is the source of morality, morality is just a matter of opinion. And this actually kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, right? When we have a belief, uh, we, have, we, we, state, uh, we state a belief, we have reasons for that, and there are implications. And one of the implications, for instance, for atheism is if God doesn't exist, then right and wrong is just a matter of opinion. So if it's my opinion that killing you is okay, then it's okay. And who are you to tell me otherwise? Okay? And we'll talk about that in detail in week number four of our series. In the last half of the series, so the last four, um, the last four uh, weeks that we will be meeting, we'll be talking about the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that we'll talk about is the death of Jesus on a Roman cross. And in fact, even the medical community published a, an article in 1986 in the Journal of the American Medal Medical Association, probably the most widely distributed medical journal out there, where they concluded that the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. And so we'll talk a lot about uh, Jesus' death and the evidence for Jesus' death on the Roman cross. 
But then we'll also talk about the deity of Jesus Christ, how he was both fully man and fully God. Many atheists and many Muslims and, and, and others will say, well, where did Jesus even say, I am God? This was something made up later. But I will uh, point out to you, and we will talk about the Bible verses, including this one in Mark 14, 61 and 62, where when Jesus was asked, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus replied, I am. Just like God replied to Moses in the burning bush, I am, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, in other words, God, and coming on the clouds of heaven. And this is hearkening back to Daniel 7. And I will tell you that right away, even now, I'll give you a little preview. Sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One puts put someone equal with God. Well, the only thing equal with God is God. So that's why the high priest tore his clothes and said he's blasphemed. They knew he was saying, I am God. Then we'll talk about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And we'll talk about all the both biblical evidence of that and the extra biblical evidence of that. And one of the ways we'll do, about, do that is we'll talk about the minimal facts approach to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas, Gary Habermas was actually one of my Liberty University professors. They are two, probably the two world experts on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And they wrote a book called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that, they talked about the minimal facts approach for the resurrection. And what they said was, we will only use facts that are agreed upon by even the most ardent skeptic scholars. Uh, many of which are ardent atheists. And so we'll talk about the minimal facts approach because, again, it lends weight to what you're saying when you're even using evidence that even the most skeptical scholars would agree with. So what are the minimal facts? Well, they are these. The death of Jesus by crucifixion, we will have already covered that, the burial in a tomb. And even Habermas says that that's one that sometimes people could argue, eh, maybe he wasn't buried in a tomb, but he still thinks he is. And the discovery of that empty tomb. And then number four, disciples, the disciples' belief that they had seen the risen Lord, that it was an absolute 100% uh, belief that they had seen him. Um, notice I'm not saying that he... They absolutely did seem, but they absolutely believed that they saw him. There's a slight difference there. Um, and as Habermas likes to say, liars don't make good martyrs. Then the fifth one is the uh, changing of heart of James, the brother of Jesus. Even in the Bible, it says that James was actually skeptical. In fact, there's a passage where he kind of comes to Jesus and says, Hey, stop talking all this crazy talk. And then later, after seeing what he believed to be the risen Christ, he, be, he ended up becoming one of the leaders of the church, and in fact, the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. And of course, then there is the great evangelist, Paul the Apostle. Of course, Paul the Apostle originally um, persecuted the church uh, of Christ uh, and uh, as Saul of Tarsus, and in fact was going on the road to Damascus to kill the disciples uh, of Christ when he had his experience with Jesus and then had a 180 degree change of heart. And so we'll talk about that. And then in the final week, we'll talk some about the manuscript evidence for the New Testament, because if you can lock down the, the evidence for the New Testament, of course, you uh, basically get the Old Testament uh, as, as, a, as a bonus, because, of course, Jesus and his disciples believed in the Old Testament. And so if you believe in the New, you kind of get the Old one uh, just thrown in there. And we'll talk about the, uh, the manuscript evidence for that, but then we'll also talk about how you reach out into your community and how you actually apply what you've learned in terms of Christian apologetics. Now, uh, as a little parting, I'd like to say there are two books that I'll be referencing quite a lot. And the first one is this one that you see on your, your screen here, and I'll have them linked in the description below. And that the first one is Christian Apologetics, A Comprehensive Case for Biblical Faith by Douglas Grotheis. Now, I will warn you, this one is pretty heavy. And so uh, if you don't have uh, a good um, kind of baseline knowledge, uh, then I would recommend actually a book called The Case for Christ, by Lee Strobel, or Cold Case Christianity by um, 
by J. Warner Wallace. And I'll also link those in the, uh, in the description below. But I like this one because it is very, very thorough. Uh, it gives a lot of good sources. You can go look up those sources. And so this was actually one of my first textbooks. The other one I will be talking about a lot is The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. And so I would like to, um, uh, to encourage you to check these books out. With that, I'm going to end today's, uh, today's recording, and uh, if you have any questions, be sure to leave a comment. Uh, make sure you give us a thumbs up and a like, and I'd like to close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that in this day and age, despite being at home and alone, I pray, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity for us in the ministry to reach out to those who are hungry for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help my words today to have touched somebody and reached somebody. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with us all and help us, although we are physically isolated, not to be mentally isolated, but rather connected. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity through social media to connect with each other in these hard times during this pandemic. Lord, thank you and bless you. And we ask that you would bless the remainder of this series that it may touch the hearts of those who view it through Christ our Savior. Amen.